so I'm Julia Borras, and I'm a permanent researcher here at the wait at Institute de Robotica Informatica Industrial, and uh, and I'm going to talk about cloth manipulation, graphs and manipulation primitives for cloth manipulation. So may I start? Or? Yes, Julia, we are on time, so perhaps you can put the, yes, the, sure, screen, yeah, of the full screen, thanks. Yeah. So, um, why clothes? No, uh, that's already one question that appeared yesterday uh, when we did the, the, the session, um, the networking session, and uh, they already asked me then, like, why, why are you doing clothes in assistive robotics? So if we want a robot uh, to, to be useful, in an environment, either in a hospital or in our homes, um, he's going to have to deal with this kind of environments where we see that there is a lot of different daily living objects. There are many and many varied, but there are also a lot of deformable objects, including clothes. And these are objects that are still quite uh, unknown by robots. Like the robots still cannot really deal with this kind of job objects. And then there is a lot of untidiness, so there is a lot of uncertainty. So, to assistive robotics is also about uh, making the robots a skill in this kind of env environment. And finally, there is also people, which is what we've been talking about uh, with uh, with Cecilio, but also with the others. No, how to can we manage to help people or help or help the, the the caregivers or or the or the doctors? So the complexity of the human environments, they go from rigid contacts where we can have robots that are that still have flexible parts, like flexible joints, but are mostly the contacts are rigid. Then we have the non-rigid contacts, which it can it happen that is either the object that is fully deformable or is the robot that is also deformable. And finally, the most complex one is the contact with people. Well, then in addition of all this deformability and rigid context, we also have this uncertainty and the safety, which basically that's uh, what Adria has been talking about with you, that then you have to care about how you move, the, the, the control, the soft control, so that if it, it touches something, it doesn't hurt anybody. And it has to deal with the uncertainty that you don't really know what the human is, is going to do, which is also true in, for, for, for the formable objects. So in this context, I'm going to talk about cloth manipulation, because we consider it as a very important object that is present in many scenarios like hospitals or uh, houses. And it's important that the robots can deal with this with these kind of objects. And what are the particularities compared to other objects of this kind of, uh, of uh, textile objects? First, that when, you, when we grasp them, they really depend on gravity. That means that they are non-prehensile. When you grasp something, uh, a grass that is, that is prehensile, it means that you can change the orientation and the, the grasp is stable. But if, the, if, if you do a platform grasp, if you change the orientation, the object is going to fall because it depends on the gravity. Well, this happens all the time with the cloth because you don't really fully grasp it. So the grass, the configuration of the object inside the hat will always depend on, on gravity. In addition, most of the times we are manipulating cloth with both of our hands. So we have about the manual tasks. And also we have different friction requirements because a lot of times one of the manipulations that we do when we manipulate cloth is this sliding along the edge where you need to have very low friction. But then when at the end you have to grasp it, then you need very high friction or hold it very strongly. And finally, of course, and the most complex thing is to deal with the high deformability that they have. That means that when, you, when we manipulate them, they're going to conform, the, the environment and the hand are going to conform shape to the object. No? And that means that also the environmental constraints are very important. In fact, when we fold, we usually help ourselves with the table to be able to, to fold. So we start talking about grasping. And um, well, the first thing that we need to realize, that I already kind of said it, is that we are kind of facing the dual problem on grasping. When they are talking about grasping and how we how we choose grasp and how the robot can decide what grasp to use, the hand normally uh, they we build all these soft hands that they have been proven to be very good for grasping, but their main idea is that they're gonna adapt to the shape of the object. But we have the opposite. 
grass is going to be the object that adapts to the to the to the handshake. The same for classic grasping, grass type, these taxonomies of grasping and how we let a robot decide how to grasp an object, it highly depends on object shape. And we, of course, need to change this because for clothes, they basically are shapeless. And we need to, to, to redefine grasping in a way that is, that is, that is more useful at the, at the moment of deciding what, to, what grass to, to choose. We started uh, revising the bibliography about uh, robot demonstrations with, uh, with uh, manipulating clothes. And the first thing that we quickly realized is that most of them, they only use the pinch grasp. Instead, if we observe humans manipulating clothes, you're quickly going to realize that we do a lot more than just a pinch. We actually revised the bibliography about grippers used for manipulating clothes, and most of them, they are basically relied on pinch grasp or pinch combinations. Some of them, they actually consider the surfaces, like here, for instance, this is flattening, and is using the surface of the table against the table, the, the hand surface, to be able to, to flatten. And finally, very few of them, they use linear fingertips, so they have a, 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 an area, a, a longer area of contact with the cloth. So what we propose is a framework for defining a grass for textiles that use, uh, that depend on the, the geometry of the, of the prehension geometries. That means we are not focusing on the object, but on the agent that is grasping and what are these geometries. So for instance, we could be grasping with points, with lines or planes. And these points, lines or planes could be either part of the gripper, but also they could be part of the environment. So we could use the table to grasp the, to do a part of the grasp of, the, of this cloth. And we know that the cloth is going to conform to this shape, so we can also use these points, lines and planes that can be either part of the environment or from the robot, from the gripper. And then we combine these geometries to define the well, I don't know if you know, but grasping is defined as, a, as two opposite forces in opposite directions. So these two geometries uh, against each other, they define a, a, a grasp. So the combination of two points, it would be the, the pinch grasp, but you can imagine that we can combine a lot of other geometries. So this kind of definition is convenient because it abstracts from the human hand, but it's also, uh, we can also define it for, for, uh, for, for robots. So for instance, here we see uh, the PR2 doing this first uh, paper that's already from 20, 2010 that was folding towels. And here we see that uh, we can define double, double grass because it's, it's performing two pinches. So we put the two in front. When it adds the contact with the table, we can also describe it. And here is performing a grasp that is using the table for flattening. So it's the combination of the plane, the pie, that is part of the gripper, and, apply, and the plane, which is the table, that is part of the, of the table. And the same for others. Notice here, or maybe, can I remove this from here? Mm, mm, I don't know. Yes, well, but now it's here. Oh, sorry. Um, it's, not, it's important to notice that in this, in this uh, formulation, when the robot is not grasping the, the object, it's also grasped, it's grasped by the table. So it's grasped by a single like, extrinsic plane. So this allowed us, for instance, to revise the bibliography and find what, these are all the grasps that we have found in the literature. But here what is important is the numbers. So the, the bigger numbers are, of course, with the pinch grasp. So our, our idea after this, this uh, this, this work is, can we go beyond only this pinch? Another thing that we demonstrated in this paper is why this matters. Okay, everybody's using the pinch, but maybe that's enough. What we demonstrated is that uh, using different grippers, here we see uh, the, a line line, a line plane, and a point point. These are the geometries that they conform. These are two fixed points that define two, two lines that they grasp. And then we do the task of folding the T-shirt in the air. And we do it manually wearing the grippers and we put these sensors for, uh, for, um, for recording the, the, the motion. And we perform this task, the same task with the different grippers. Of course, depending on the gripper, the task is, it, it looks different. And now we will see the results. Like this is the trajectory using the line line where the rotation was happening exactly at the same axis of rotation. So we didn't need to do 
the full rotation like it happened here because the rotation axis was here in the center. And this is the one from the from from the, the pins. This is interesting already. They already show difference. But here, what is more important is these red points here. What is happening here? Here we are seeing the profile, the velocity profiles of the actions aligned at the moment of uh, of placing the, ta the, the, the cloth on the table. And what we see is that here there is a pinch, it's basically this, uh, this uh, maximum accelerations that we see here. It's basically that when, when we are doing the pinch, we need to, conf to give a lot of velocity to the cloth to um, translate this dynamic. That basically means that the, that the dynamics of the task change a lot if the geometry of the gripper helps you to do the task. So we can simplify the dynamics if we have chosen the correct grasp to, to manipulate the cloth. So based on these results, we enter into uh, designing a gripper that could be that could do the pinch grasp, which of course is very important, but also we were uh, um, taking a look or we were interested in this following task. First, the, the manipulation of folded clothes. So it's not only important to be able to fold, but it's also important that once we have objects that are already fold, we need to be able to manipulate them without get, get letting them get unfold and then placing them, for instance, inside the shelf or inside the closet or inside the drawers. Here in the literature, this has been done with pinch grasp in mostly open loops. What we, what we think, what we design is that we probably need this uh, planner support at the base that would help in manipulating this cloth without getting, uh, without getting unfolded. The folding the t-shirt in the air, again, when we do it as humans, we do a lot of things with the hands. This has been done in the literature, again, in, in open loop. Well, in open loop, no, because Adria Colomé did it uh, with reinforcement learning. And it has been done with a double pinch, but precisely in, in our group, uh, we noticed that when we were substituting the, the normal pins by uh, this double line one, they were actually uh, reducing the time of learning a lot for this kind of, uh, of task. It's because it was simplifying the, the dynamics of the task. So basically we need either a double line or a, do a line with a combination with a plane. And finally, this tracing and the edge, we are also very interested in this kind of tasks. And then what is interesting here is, yes, we are, uh, this existed in the literature, uh, but only with very, very simple clothes and very small ones. Of course, it's done with a double pins. What is interesting here is the requirements for the pins that is holding versus the, the pins that is actually sliding are very different in terms of, of friction. So with these ideas in mind, we propose uh, this gripper design where it had a base, uh, 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 base finger that could split into an open, and then it has an upper finger that has hidden a, pi a piece of high friction. And then we use a motor to push this high friction piece out. That means that, um, and in addition, it can be, it can do the pins, it can do this double line, it can also do the line with the plane when you open the best finger, and you can also it also has a planar base that can be on top of the table if you need to flatten it. And here you see the the the, the idea of the gripper is that it can be used, for instance, for uh, for picking folded clothes with the bass finger open. And here we see that if we try to grasp uh, big clothes without having the friction, it's not strong enough. But if we activate the friction, then we can. The, 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 the force that we can hold with the same pinch is, is much bigger. And this is also useful, this variable friction when you need to do sliding. So you, you can slide along the edge and then activate the friction at the end so that, uh, that you are grasping much strongly the, 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 the piece of cloth. And finally, the folding in the air, which we still haven't demonstrated that with the robot. Uh, well, I'm going to show you. This is a still, all, we, we had to do it, we only had one prototype, so we had to do it half the, the, with the gripper and half with the, with the half. Similar to what I showed you before, we showed that this matter is uh, using a motion capture system where we piled and we unpiled and piled a set of, of, uh, of t-shirts 
using the abducted fingers or, or the non-abducted, so the, the base closed fingers or not. And we instructed the subjects to always do it well, because uh, you know that humans, we are very good and we can do anything. So if we give the fingers open, they can pile, but if they, we give them the fingers closed, they can also pile. The difference is going to be in the, dynam the dynamics that we apply to the task without even realizing, because at the moment of placing, if the fingers are open, basically the, 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 the cloth is already much flattened and you can basically lower the hand and leave the, 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 the cloth. But if the fingers are more closed, then the cloth deforms more. And then you need to, when you place it, they perform this, uh, this dynamic motion that they first go up and then down in a fast way, which is quite complex to do it with a robot, honestly. So we've been keep working on this gripper design. So now uh, uh, we reduced a lot the base by aligning the rotation axis of the base finger. And now it's much smaller. And in addition, we are only using now uh, uh, one single motor. So we don't, for, for the high friction piece, basically when the, the gripper closes, but then if it keep pushes, if it keeps pushing, it pushes out this piece of high friction. Basically, is, is this piece here, and you can see in this in this video that when it keeps pushing, I don't know, it keeps pushing, and then is when it pushes out this this little piece that is the one that has a high friction. So this results that with only two two motors, the one to open and the one to open the the base finger, then we can we can also have this variable friction. In addition, we also put a sensor, uh, a potentiometer in the flexible finger in a way that uh, connected to a microcontroller, it can detect when we are lowering the hand until it touches the, the, touches the table. We also integrate it in the Tiago, so they've been working very hard, our technicians, to integrate the electronics of the, of the gripper in the, in the Tiago, and here you see that it, it, it is lowering until it touches the table. When it feels that it touches the table, then it goes to grasp. Here the vision is still not integrated. You're, you're going to do actually this. You're going to see this demo actually in the lab tomorrow, uh, together with the, with the navigation. And uh, basically, that's the, the improvement that we've been working in continuation with this version of the, of the gripper. Another thing that uh, that I also work uh, with is this uh, knowledge representation. That means how to make the robots understand what is the task they are doing in a general manipulation task, but also dealing with clothes, which is a little bit more complex. So when you are executing a robotic task that is autonomous, there is this execution loop where there is a decision-making tool that decides what is the action that needs to happen. Then after you selected what is the transition or the action that you want to execute, you need to actually execute it using these controllers that Adria has shown you, the, the planification of the trajectory. And then after the action has been executed, you need to look again at the scene and see what happened and recognize what have you, have you done. If you actually done what you expected or if you need to replan. So after this state recognition, you go back to the decision tool. So here, in the case of cloth manipulation, the bottleneck or the, the part that is really complex is the state recognition. Because as you can imagine, when we manipulate an object that is rigid, the only thing that matters is the position and orientation of the object. That is six degree of freedom that we need to understand where the object uh, is in the scene. But with clothes, not only is the, there is the position and the orientation, but also all the deformability of the object which this is an infinite space dimensional, um, infinite dimensional space of, of the, the configuration state of the cloth. State of the art has focused mainly on recognizing or understanding the state of the formation of ungrass clothes. And what we are proposing is to consider inside the state of the cloth, also what is the grasping state, so recognize if, it's the, if the cloth is already grasped or not, and what is the state of the formation after grasping, and also the environmental contact state, if it's touching the table or it's not touching the table, because that might simplify a lot already what is the state. For instance, the cloth can be completely crumpled, but if you know that you, that you grasp it at the, correct, at the correct corner, you already have half of the work done, because you can lift it, remove it from the table, and you already have it grasped by one of the corners. 
So what we propose is to have this representation, this high-level representation of a seal as a graph. And this high-level representation, that means that we want to define these states that at the high level are going to be semantic states. That means the cloth is grass, but is, is touching the table, but is crumpled, or is already folded, or is in the middle of being folded. That's going to define the number, a finite number of states that we need to identify, which means that it can simplify the state recognition. And it's also easier to identify where you are located in this graph. This graph also, directly, we are going to show today that can be used as a decision-making tool because the graph can capture all the possible strategies for doing a task and then being translated into a PDDL language for high-level planning. And finally, we also are envision, uh, envisioning this idea that we have the state definition, the high-level definition of the state, but then we want to recognize these low-level um, parameters, these low-level features, that are needed to be in order in order in order to execute the, the task. For instance, if the if the cloth is crumpled on the table, but we can identify where one corner is, that location of the corner is a low level parameter that is important when if you need to grasp it. So and depending on the high level, different parameters are, are, are gonna be relevant or not to execute the task. And finally, this graph. We want to learn it from human demonstrations. That means that from videos of human demonstrations, we should be able to autonomously learn what these humans are doing to learn how this task is, is executed by humans. So here we see an example of, uh, of uh, one of these graphs, and you don't need to just take the idea that this is a graph um, of folding a, a napkin in three folds. Uh, this is a representation where each one of the nodes is a state of the scene and the transitions are actions. So that means that each one of these nodes represents graphically or semantically a different state of the, of the, of the manipulation process. In this case, performed by humans wearing one of these uh, cameras in the head. And here we see, for instance, here is still the, 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 the napkin is on the table. Here is already grasped. Here you already like put it flat up here, but it's still not on the table. Then you place it flat on the table, and then you keep going until until you fold. Um, we call this the, the cohesion graph because uh, we actually have uh, we are working with this graph in different projects, and the idea is that it's going to give a high level understanding of the scene that is going to be able uh, it's going to enable the robot to understand what is going on, where is it going. And, and maybe also give some explainability on why is it taking decisions or why is it taking so long sometimes to do certain tasks. So if we pay a little bit more attention of one, on each one of these states, for instance, in this one, we see that here it's basically a semantic state that collects information about the grass type, the grass location, and the cloth configuration state. So for the grasp type, basically it's using the notation that I explained before about our grasping taxonomy framework. Basically here is using a pinch grasp, but is also in, in contact with the table, so the pi extrinsic. For the grass location, what we did is we defined a local system of coordinates in the cloth, mainly on the edge of the cloth, that is re with respect to the, to the user that is manipulating it. So we have the left and the right corner that really depends on the, on the human. Even more, actually, it depends on where is it grasping. So in this case, we like you see when it's flat, it's very easy to understand what these coordinates are. But when it's not flat, it's not that it's not that easy. So a left corner in this case is because the the subject grasps the cloth with the right hand. If it would have grasped it with the left hand, that would be the left corner because then the manipulation would have do, been done in a way that it would have ended up being the left corner. So there is a little bit of complexity here too. Why is important grasp location? Because if we're trying to define what the robot is doing, only with the grasp is not enough to understand what is going on. For instance, in this task that is doing this edge tracing, the robot starts uh, um, picking with the, with the, with the pins. Then it's, it's performing a double pins, but what is important is it's performing this double pins very close to the first one. And then finally, it slides until it reaches the other corner. If you don't have this information of the location, um, it's very it's very difficult to have a, a high level idea of what the task is is about. 
And also notice that instead of using this, uh, this, uh, this coordinates, what we do is for having this graphical representation, we write this, uh, this square and then we put where the grass points are. But basically, it's, it's, there is an easy way of translating from the graphical representation to the semantic definition of what are the, the corners that are grass. And finally, we also the, uh, put a semantic label of what is the cloth configuration state. So basically, our idea is that there are macro states of the formation that then they will need different uh, low level parameters where you probably will need to go more in depth of what is the state of the formation. But it's not the same if you already have the flat corner that you probably need to pay attention to certain things, that if it's cramped or if it's folded. So for now on, for, for now, we are only um, identifying this high level state. If it's folded, uh, flat, clamped, or partially folded, partially flat. So, uh, in addition, finally, this is the definition state, but then we also put a semantic tag to each one of the transitions because they are normally associated to a, a, a task that can be described, described in, a, in, a, in a high level way. These semantic tags are important because then, if you need to retrieve information and give it to the user where you are, that you are assisting, it's, it's an easy way that the robot can take these semantic tags and directly speak to the robot in a, to the subject in a way that can that the subject can understand the robot. So basically, that's the idea. We have these semantic uh, tags that are translated into graphical representations just for the sake of, of drawing the, the graph. And here I'm going to show you an example of how we are labeling. So at the beginning, we were doing that fully manually. That means that uh, using a subtitle software, every time there was a change of states of either the grass type, the grass location, or the of the or the configuration state of the cloth, we were putting a a, a, a attack in in the in the time in the time stamp. Like the, and here, what is interesting is that we did that for different subjects. We did that with eight subjects for each one of the tasks. And even though they were instructed to do exactly the same task. They all did it with different number of steps, different order, and different graph types. Basically, that's that's the, the graph of different strategies that we can capture after uh, seeing uh, the, the execution of this task by several subjects. And this is the same by, for, for uh, different tasks, that is putting the tablecloth. So the subjects, they have to unfold it from a folded state and then put it on top of the table. And this is the graph of the different things that we could see that the subjects they were doing, even though the task again was very simple. So that's the that's the that's the the full graph for folding a napkin that we recorded from the subjects. But also, this is is not exactly the full graph in the sense that in the sense that here we did a lot of uh, refinement when we record the data and we label it, we distinguish between left left and right hand. But for the high level understanding of what the robot is doing, probably the robot is always going to use the same task, so it's the same hand. So it's always going to grasp with the left hand or with the right hand. So we, we want to um, merge these two ideas, these two symmetrics, because it's the same, that if you fall with the right and then you, you grasp with the right and then you fall with the left or the opposite. So we did this exercise of, of, uh, of, this, of merging these two symmetries. And in addition, we also ask the data to uh, this, these transitions to appear at least three times in the data because we have a lot of sparsity. There are subjects that they did for, they did the task, but in a very single tone way that only, only one time for that subject. And so we have a lot of sparsity in the data. So that would be the, 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 the remaining graph, which starts here from crumpled and it finishes here at folded state. But if you want to see without requ without requiring this uh, this uh, at least appear uh, at least appear three times in the data, we have a lot more of of, uh, of, our, of edges, a lot of actions. In reality, because we have an automatic way of of loading this into a high level planning, that wouldn't be too much of a of a problem. But then you need to recognize a lot more states, of course. And that's the graph that we found for the for the folding. It's it's interesting that you see that they they end up that they partition the, the they they all they both go through this um, canonical state. Let's put it where is grasp here flat grasping by 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 two triples. And you see here it also like 
you unfold it until you're here and then you do the next of the task and the other the, the, the for the other task is just the opposite way so here uh, for planning for high level planning what we did is we demonstrated that uh, that uh, in normally in classical planning in high level planning we have these fluids the actions and the initial and goal stage so the initial and goal states are basically defined by this stage that we define with the grass time the grass location and the cloth configurations the fluids are basically the 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 the, 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 the states of, the, of possible things that you can do are the the all these grass types, grass locations, and grass configurations, and the actions are these transitions. Basically, the, the actions are defined by preconditions and effects. So the initial state is the precondition, and the goal state is the is the effect of the action. So uh, if we save this graph into a comma-separated value using the semantic task, then it can be easily translated into PDDL domain using strips. And here we found that six different grass types, seven different grass locations, and four different cloth configurations, and a total of 27 actions. Then we demonstrated that, for instance, for a sub part of the of the of the graph, if the init, if the init state is the crumpled and the gold state is the is the flat and grass by two corners, we could uh, use a solver to find all the possible the possible ways of going from one to the other that are given in the graph and to find these solutions uh, what we needed to do is to with the solver is to manually click the 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 cost of each one of the actions in this case we just did it manually but the idea here is that the robot is going to be is, it will have to have an understanding of depending on the abilities that they have for instance here if you want to go stay here, there is a way of going from here to here. That is, of course, the most efficient way. But for this, you need that the second corner is already visible without doing almost any manipulation. In this case, you need to have the ability of sliding along the, the tracing of the edge. If you don't have this, this ability, then you're only left with either this option that depends on the cloth configuration, if, the, if you have a corner visible, or um, in this case, where basically you grasp, the, you grasp it, you, you lift it, and then with vision, you need to locate the second corner. And this vision is usually a very complex task that is usually very slow. So depending on the skills that the robot has, we'll have to decide what is the, the cost to decide uh, which one of the actions can be done. So, Sorry, uh, Julia, we have several questions here at the chat. Okay. I don't see anything from here, so... No, yeah. so uh, I don't know if you can open the, the chat or not. If you prefer, I can read. Yeah, so let me just finish this slide because okay. then I change topic, okay? okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Okay, okay. In, in what I show you so far is that I, I was manually label all these states. What we did with one student is to actually train uh, efficient net with 10 of these semantic states to show that they can be automat autonomously identified. And it was very interesting because we trained the, the network with these kind of images, and then they were, we were just putting what is what was the semantic state, and then we actually computed the attention maps, and we could see that the network was actually paying attention to these relevant points, you know, like the corners where the grass are, if they are touching the table or not, etc. And so that's now I'm going to move to a different a different topic. So maybe it's a good moment to. Was I don't see you. Let me look for you. Ah, here. Question. From Pablo Castellanos to the end. Ah, starting from the end. No, Pablo Castellanos, uh, after Angel Lopez has a question for you. It's the, it was the first question, Pablo Castellanos. Alicia, Pablo, and Pablo. Four questions here, four comments. I've seen, we have seen this application in another presentation, in this one of your main words on the lab. How important is currently the task of grasping in the R&D? Are there a lot of research groups in these tasks? Thanks. I'm not sure what is the application that you're talking about, Pablo. You have here two more questions from Pablo, perhaps you can 
But do you use to detect the corners? Uh, I'm going to show you now what uh, we use to detect the, the corners. Um, and planning, do you use only PDDR? Yeah, for planning, we use the strips so far and only PDDR. But we are working in collaboration with another group that is expert in planning. And we are actually now thinking about how we can uh, use this graph to, um, to give explainability to the planner. Uh, grasping in general, okay. So grasping in, in general, if it's important, well, it, it's important because at the end you need to do it. Um, the problem with the cloth is that it's relatively easy to grasp it if you don't care how you grasp it. <laughs> so basically, but every time that you fold, you need to grasp. And um, it's true that a lot of people are not paying attention to grasping. But what we are proposing is that uh, it can actually be very relevant. You can always do the pinch grasp and then more or less. But the, what is also very important is the, the direction where, uh, like, okay, you grasp with a pinch, but then the direction, depending on how you move, is going to affect a, a the final cloth configuration. And uh, yes, it is relevant. Grasping is still a very active area of research. And uh, the reason why nobody has done it in, 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 in well, maybe a, only a few researchers are, are talking about grasping for clothes is because uh, there is really not a lot of advanced um, knowledge on the formability to understand what happens when you grasp in something else that is not just a pinch. And two more questions, Alicia and Mario. Alicia, what kind of sensors? Yeah, so, so far we are not using any sensors, Alicia, to detect that, that, that the hand has been, has, that has grabbed something. We actually had a project where we sensed the gripper so that it could know if there, is, uh, if there was something grasped or not. The steady identification that I show you Basically, was learning that autonomously from the image. So it was only, I, thought, I think that was also another question from Mario, that a little, a little bit more of the state estimation in the deep learning. In the deep learning, it was an end to end. So we were just showing the images in a video, and we were saying what were the states, uh, the, the changing of the state. So we were using all the frames that are from the one same state as, a, as the label, and the system alone was learning what was the state, including if it was grasped or not, if it was touching the table or not. We probably can, can use a lot of other information because in a robotic system, we have other ways of knowing if the cloth is, is grasped or not. So we can probably improve this by, by adding other, but then you need to integrate everything. I don't know, I'm lost because there are so many. You have uh, a, a question by Carla Rodriguez. Uh... What you want to do, Carla? Go ahead. Yes, that I had a question regarding the map that you showed before about the graphs theory that you used to um, plan the, all the possibilities that the robot uh, st studied before taking a decision. Mm -hmm. and how did you plan that, uh, or how did you elaborate that? The graph, you mean? Yes. Um, you mean this uh, this graph here? Yes. So this we learn it from the from the so here in the labeling in this in particular we learn it from this execution we recorded several subjects doing the task and we manually label it and from this we build a graph from from this basically you study what are all the the same, the, the same task and how many actions land to this in this in this particular state and then you build the graph uh, you you can learn the graph from this data. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, you can go ahead, Julia, thank you. Okay, where was I? Yeah, benchmarking. So another another of the things that we are interested in is benchmarking for cloth manipulation. Benchmarking is very important in manipulation in general, but it's very difficult. Uh, so one of the things that with this graph we can do easily is identify different steps that are relevant in the task. For instance, here, the first one is grasping. So that's the first grasp. But then all these subtasks that goes from this state to this state, you see that they are already bottlenecks. So this defines the task of unfolding in the air. It's called in the literature, it's called like this, unfolding in the air. 
Then the, this part is about placing flat on the table when you already have the grasping like this. Then we have the first fold, the second fold, the third floor. That is relevant in the moment of defining how to evaluate a task because there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, discussion in the literature about how do you evaluate, for instance, grasping, if it's a good grasp or if it's not a good grasp. And a lot of people, they, they say that it, what, what it matters is the function. So it's not only about being able to grasp something, but also what are you going to do with this thing that is already grasped? Because you might be able to grasp it, but in a way that you cannot use the object, and then it's not relevant, or it, it shouldn't be considered a, a successful grasp. That is the same with cloth, or even more complex. For instance, here we have two uh, grasps. One is for unfolding, and the other is for, for picking a folded tools. In one, you need to grasp only one of the of the of the of the light of the edges, and in the other, you need to grasp the full pack of. of and then in addition, okay, this was good for picking, but then for placing, is it good? So all this, uh, um, in, in the case of cloth, is really, uh, grasping is very easy. I already said before, you can grasp the cloth in many ways. Like you can go there, close the gripper, and it's so soft that for sure you're going to grasp something. But then can you do something with this thing that you grasp? Which that is the, 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 the complex thing. This graph allows to do a definition of the task in a steps that then you can benchmark either individually or as a whole. And uh, that's interesting because we, what we can see is we, that we can see that there are some edges that are very relevant for the whole task, but then there are others that actually get corrected and that they are not that relevant if they are doing in a very high precision. So for instance, one of the tasks that we are doing is this pick and place, which again, you're going to see that tomorrow in the, in the, in the lab. Here, first we detect with a depth camera where the location of the of the folded cloth is. We define what is the the the, the shape and where is it better to grasp it. So we decide what is the grasping point. But then the problem we have is that the that's what the what the robot sees. So this is the 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 grasping point depending on the shape that it's uh, is it playing or not playing? Okay, that is the grasping point that the robot has decided. The problem is here, in the moment that you have to leave it, it's what I was saying, okay, you grasp it, but then can you actually uh, place it in a, in a nice way? Well, this placing, it will depend on how much it has the form. The towel is very rigid and not, doesn't deform a lot, but this napkin is a, a lot thinner and deforms a lot. So what we do here is that uh, we are working on, this is a working project, where we are doing a, a continuous measure that describes the, 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 the deformation of this cloth, of the folded cloth, after it's being grasped, in order to decide what's the different, the different placing strategies. And here you will see different placing strategies. Depending on how the form is the object, you cannot go there and just leave it. Here in the bottom one, it just places it flat without doing too much. But in this one, it's actually using uh, uh, this, this uh, manipulation that is not dynamic, but it uses the friction so that it, 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 it helps with this, uh, dealing with this deformation. So that is, then the idea is this, uh, this uh, definition of the deformation that we do both when it's grasped and when it's not grasped, it also can be used to define if the task has been done correctly in an autonomous way. So it's useful not only for benchmarking, but also it could be used for reinforcement learning and for, for, for letting the robot alone himself understand if he has done the task for a Leon. Another idea of what I said before that some of the edges get corrected is the, uh, is the edge tracing. So the edge tracing normally works that, that you have the cloth uh, crumpled on the table and then you have one grasp by one corner. Then you grasp with another pinch very close and then you slide. And when it's like when when you slide when you reach the other corner you lift it and then you can place it flat on the table and start folding when we collect that from humans what we see is that it's a little bit more complex these are this is symmetric the left and the right so if we pay attention to the last step what we see is that sometimes the humans they were not really reaching the corner so we actually did a study of how relevant it was to actually reach the corner if we want to do a, a, because we are also working, we still cannot show you, but we are working towards this action of sliding and reaching the corner. But sometimes with the robot autonomous, they cannot really reach exactly the corner. The question is how relevant is it to then do the next step? 
So here what we did is that we had the tiagos um, placing the, the, the cloth flat on the table, and then we had a continuous measure of error depending on the, on, the, on the perimeter that was detected on the table. This was only with color segmentation. And the idea is that then we evaluated in this. This is, is grasped exactly at the corner, but this is grasped more inside the edge, and this is more on the other edge, and here is more grasping in, inside the, 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 the cloth. And the idea here, what we are showing is the error uh, in, the, in the placing, so how much wrinkles, basically is, is how much of the area of the total full area extended was covered. And what we see is that, for instance, this is the, the, the case of uh, grasp at exactly at the corner, and this is grasp on the top edge. This is grasping at the at the at the lateral edge, and this is more inside. So you can see that here the, there is a still very little error, and then the error gets much bigger once we go down towards. But this is actually up to this is 25% in the edge. So basically, you you only need to reach up to 25 75% of the length, and it's enough already to do a task with very little error. And that de depends on the cloth. For instance, for the small tower, there was even much less. So basically, you could do almost no error, even though you were only reaching up to 25% far away from the corner. And here, for the, for the other project, we had different trajectories for placing, so we could compare if it was depending on the trajectory or not. So this is an example of an edge that if you benchmark it individually, you might get different errors, but then these errors, what is important is that in the full task, they are not really relevant for because for the next action, you can execute it correctly, even though you haven't performed this in maybe the most accurate way. And this is for the big tower. But again, these errors, they go very, they go very uh, big when you are very far. This is 37% inside the, far away from the corner. Uh, well, this is percentage is according to the total length of the edge but then it's very slow is up to 12 percent and then another idea of course that is also relevant for benchmarking is to actually benchmark the the, the whole task so here we have the tiagos placing a tablecloth and you can benchmark individually each one of the steps and if it's able to grasp the first corner if it's able to do the the the, the sliding so that it's uh, to flattening the the, the cloth and then placing the tablecloth. But then, of course, and that's the same for all the tasks. The problem is the complexity is very, is very, is very big. But it's not the same if you do it well that if you actually have it completely uneven. So here we actually measure a measure that is very ad hoc. I don't like it because it's very ad hoc. In the sense that for placing a tablecloth, what is relevant is that the tablecloth is centered and is not rotated with respect to the table. And basically, it hangs the same amount in, in both directions. In this case, it was, uh, it was scored manually, but it could be easy to have a set of cameras that actually me measure this in, autonom in an autonomous way. But then, of course, what it would be very difficult is to actually have the robots repeat the experiment, repeat and be able to, for instance, do reinforcement learning with this measure that is global. Because the robots alone, they couldn't be able to go themselves back to the initial point to actually repeat the task and then and then learn from that. Another thing that I wanted to mention, and that's already last, the last the last thing I'm going to talk about, is that uh, for benchmarking, is it was it's also very relevant in manipulation to share the same objects. That was very that uh, has become very relevant in in, in rigid objects manipulation with the YCB object set that has been quite widespread and a lot of tasks, a lot of papers now they are based on this object set that we also have this, this plate and this uh, cutlery and the glasses are part of this YCB object set. And from the people of the object set, uh, the YCB object set, they contact us to actually extend this to include textile objects. This is a complex task because there is a lot of variety of clothes. And the main problem is that you don't have continuity in the stock for finding them. So that is very crazy for clothes, but for household uh, objects, maybe not that much. And that's what we propose. So we have these, uh, the, the objects that you can find at home that are textiles, for instance, for instance kitchen items. This, we have these uh, kitchen, kitchen racks. Then we have bathroom items, the towels, which we have 
different sizes. Of course, there are very different size towels. And then we have repetitions. For the medium one, we have five, so that it's, we can do tasks like piling. Then we have tablecloth, um, and we have a, a, a square tablecloth, but also a round tablecloth, and then also napkins. And finally, we also have uh, bed sheets, which these are gigantic, and they are very difficult to manipulate, and the fitted bed sheet is definitely a very challenging object. Also, like for instance, we could do the, the, the task of putting the pillow inside the, the pillowcase. Again, we are thinking in the future. It's not that we are already solving all this. And basically, the problem with this is the stock continuity. So what we did is we acquired a lot of these, of these object sets. And now to distribute them in the community, we are organizing a competition that is going to be part of the IROS competitions of this next IROS that is going to happen in, in Kyoto. And so we're going to be a part of one of the tasks of the service track for cloth manipulation and perception with textiles. And uh, here you can, uh, you can go to the website. And if you participate, you're going to get one of these object sets for free in your lab. And uh, we already have the rule book, but the registration link is still not there, but it's going to be soon there. And the idea is going to be an online competition in this case. For this, for this task in particular, it's going to be fully online, which means that the groups can use their own setups. And we're going to connect to the labs so that that's all. We, wanna, we want an easy entry point to the community, which means that not only they're going to be able to use their own setup, but also uh, they can either participate only doing perception, and then we will ask to detect grasping points, and also the direction of grasping for the grasping points, or manipulation. That means assuming that we have like uh, markers in the corners that we already know where they are, they can only do the manipulation. And we will have two tasks, the folding and the unfolding. The idea is that People, they don't have to do the whole thing. You can only do one part, and then it's an entry point with the idea of getting to know the community that is working in cloth manipulation and also um, um, distributing this, this cloth set. And, and that's all, if you have more questions. Thanks, Julia. We have three questions at the chat. Okay. From Alejandro. Yeah, without any surface under the object. Well, then it's more difficult. <laughs> One of the things that happens now when I observe people doing cloth manipulation is that you notice that we do a lot of things and it's actually difficult to fold in the air, but mainly it's difficult because we do this regrasping. I don't know if you're going to be able, I'm going to stop presenting and then it's go I'm going to be bigger. So. You fold, and then you do this thing, that, that you do this, and then you do this regrasp, so that then you, you continue, and then you do it, it again, and then we do this, and we can do we can do a lot of things. But that's very complex to do it with a robot. You would need a very dedicated gripper just to do this regrasp thing. And so the, 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 the manipulation of doing this, is, it could be easy, but then this regrasp, that's a bottleneck at this point. So yes, we could do it, but it's even more complex. And also, when the when the, the cloth is on the table, it's also easier to detect what is the the middle state of, of 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 folding, because then you also need to decide. So far, the papers that exist on folding, the strategy for folding was predefined. That means first we fold this part, and then we're gonna see this silhouette, and then you fold the second part, and then you're gonna see this silhouette, and and go, and so on. The autonomous detection of what is the state and what is would be a good strategy for folding in a in a high level way autonomously, this hasn't been done for cloth yet. And do you need a table? Like uh is there any experiments that have been carried out without uh, using a table to fold? Yes. There is there is a group, I don't remember the name now, that was doing one single fold in a very crazy way that was flipping the, the, the cloth and, re, and regrasping the, the corners like this. So it was like this. I don't know if you can see. They were doing like this. I cannot even do it. But the robot was able to do it. Yeah, yeah. But they had like a super fast, uh, super fast gripper that was able to do this in very high speed. And uh, wow. there are a few things. The, the thing is that if we use the table, why the robots cannot use the table? The problem of using the table is that you need to collide with it, of course. Which, 
is another problem that you will see tomorrow. I tomorrow no today uh, in the lab tour in the lab tour that we need to collide with the objects, which is the opposite of what you normally want to do. Yes. Okay. Thank you. A question from Mario and from Angel. In which specific kind of industry? So we had a lot of interest from the industry of fashion, for instance. One of the things that are very similar, for instance, for the for the task of placing it flat on the table, not exactly placing flat on the table, but there is a very specific task that we are talking already with uh, with several industries that are in the, interested, where they have the clothes already hanging in a hanger. And, and you have a dress hanging. I don't have any hanger now, but you know this 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 cloth hanger. And they need to put them inside the boxes for shipping. So the the clothes are already very nicely put in the. And then you need to grasp the, the this this hanger that is already hanging in one of these bags, and then do a manipulation that is like this to put it flat inside the, a, a box. Or in so so that is one thing. It would be relatively similar to what we were doing of placing it flat on the table, but only with a single arm. And there is a ton of like actually there is a lot of application in the industry fact in the in the industry of of, uh, of fashion because now I don't know if you realize, but now nowadays everybody buys everything online. And when you buy clothes online, a lot of people they buy the size M and the size L. They try it at home and then they return the, the ones that they don't. They don't fit them, which means that these companies they get a lot of unsorted clothes that they don't know if they have been manipulated, if they have been damaged inside the box, and they need people because that cannot be automated that open the box and figure out if they return correctly the things that they said that they they return, if they are actually in good state, and then fold them back in a state that is good enough so that they can be put back in the system to be sold again. So in, in all this chain of steps of tasks that I said, we, we proposed several projects where we could do not all of it, but a part of it. But yes, there is a, a lot of, for the industry of uh, making the clothes, there is already a lot of automation, but there is not a lot of automation, actually almost none, for this um, inverse logistics that is called. So this logistics of people returning items, and then they need to be put back in the, in the, in the system. And okay, then another we have Sorry. a comment on a, on a question from Angel. I think the last one. Have you tried to put the folded sheet in the table and then let the robot extend it? Wouldn't it be more precise than picking it in the air? I'm not sure what, what you mean. If you mean placing like crumpled on the table and then and then try to slide on corners. Mm, well, it's the same then, it's the same. You need to then, for sliding, you need to perform a grasp that is pushing against the table and then sliding. So it's actually not more, not simpler than actually grasping in the air. And uh, so, and then you still also need to understand what, if, you, if the cloth is already flat or not. So. Yeah, it's, it's another strategy. Like that's the, the the beauty or the complexity that that you can really do things in many ways. The last question. If I if okay, yeah, in Gazebo we we don't use Gazebo, but we have used uh, other simulators. We've been using Unity. We've been using um, uh, how is it called that one? Uh, uh, well, now I don't remember, but yeah, there is a, lot, a ton of simulators for cloth manipulation. The main problem is that, uh, especially when you do dynamic tasks, the dynamics of the clothing simulation are very different from, from, from the real one. So then when you do learning in simulation, there is a big gap to actually go to this gap, they, they call it the sim to real, to actually then perform things in but yeah, especially to understand the formation, and we are working, I, I didn't present it because it's still really in, in an early stage, but we are working on indexes uh, that describe this, the, the, the deformability of the state of the formation of the cloth, and, uh, and we are doing them in simulation, at least to start with, to have all the information. 
And then the challenge is to be able to perceive this in, in, because you know clothes have a lot of self occlusions and it's difficult to understand the, the whole where the whole object is. I don't know if that answers your question. You have another uh, comment from Angel and I think yes. Yeah, it's very different the simulation. That's a problem. That it behaves very differently because it basically so far I, I like as far as I know, there are no simulations that can simulate a grasp. That means what you do for grasping clothes is you assume that you have a point that you control where this point goes, but they don't describe, they don't simulate the friction or the and, and the contact that is grasping and the area that is grasped, etc. Uh, so that's already one difference. And uh, but already the, when you move the dynamics of the cloth in the simulation are very different than, than in reality. And uh, we, we have somebody in the group that that, that 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 actually developed a simulator with the idea of being it more similar to reality. And it's less beautiful, but maybe more realistic, which that's what it would be needed for robotics. Okay. okay. Julia, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to all the participants also, and we will return at 14.15 uh, after lunchtime. Thank you, Julia, again. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye-bye.